And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Jane Fu, who is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia, conducting her research out of the Vancouver Prostate Center. Jane moved here from Singapore in 2013 to attend UBC for her undergraduate studies, and is also a volunteer on our Father's Day Walk Run Committee and a two-time awardee of the PCFBC Grant and Aid. Jean will be speaking on her research, Structure-Based Development of MYC Inhibitors for Neuroendocrine Prostate Cancer. All right, so I'll turn it over to you, Jane. Hello, can everyone hear me and see my slides? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be talking about my research today titled, um, as Rochelle mentioned, Structure-Based Development of MIG Inhibitors for Neuroendocrine Prostate Cancer. So, sorry, one sec. Let me just get our faces out of the way here. Okay, so first I'm gonna go over what neuroendocrine prostate cancer is. So we start off with primary prostate cancer that is typically driven by androgens or testosterone. So what happens is the androgens bind to the androgen receptor which um, turns on these genes that drive the progression of prostate cancer. So, so this type of prostate cancer is typically treated with androgen deprivation therapy or ADT, which limits the amount of androgens in the body, sort of like getting rid of the food that the cancer needs to survive. Um, a subset of these will then develop into a more aggressive form called castration resistant prostate cancer. Um, and this type of cancer is typically treated with antiandrogens or chemotherapy. But once again, a subset of these will develop into an even more aggressive form called neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Now, what's interesting about neuroendocrine prostate cancer, or NEPC, is that they no longer express the androgen receptor. However, what they do express is an increased amount of this protein called NMIC. So how NMIC is increased is through amplification or overexpression. And what this means is we normally have the normal amount of the NMIC gene, and this will give the normal amount of the NMIC mRNA, which is sort of the instructions for making the protein, and will result in the normal amount of the NMIC protein. However, when we have gene amplification, we have more number of copies of that gene, which will result in more, more amounts of the mRNA and more amounts of the NMIC protein. So why do we care about this NMIC? So NMIC is a driver of neuroendocrine prostate cancer, and we think it's what allows this cancer to be dependent of, um, uh, or it's what allows the cancer to be independent of, of the androgen receptor and promote the emergence of neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So as I mentioned, it's typically overexpressed in neuroendocrine prostate cancer and is normally associated with resistance to current treatments. So how NMIC works is it binds to its partner called MAX, um, and it forms a sort of complex of the two proteins, which I will call the MIC-MAX complex. And what this complex does is it goes in and it binds to the DNA, which turns on these genes that um, promote cancer development and progression. Um, so on the right here, we have the, the structure of the MIC and MAX complex. So this is just the portion of the MIC-MAX complex that binds the DNA. So this sort of dark blue spiral here is MIC and the, the light blue is MAX. And it binds to the DNA, which is shown here in red and yellow. Um, so this NMIC protein is not a new, sort of new protein that we've just discovered. It was discovered over 40 years ago. There have been done, like extensive research has been done on it. Um, and a lot of drug development efforts have occurred to try to target this NMIC protein. However, till this day, um, we have not yet come up with a clinically useful MIC inhibitor. Um, and it is widely known that this protein NMIC is undruggable. So why is MIC considered undruggable? Well, first of all, when you have um, a protein that you want to drug, you sort of need to find a good location on its surface to drug. And one of these um, sections of the proteins is a site where it sort of does its activity. However, MIC lacks one of those active sites. Its function is mainly to sort of interact with other proteins. So then we think, why don't we just find a drug that stops it from interacting with other proteins? Well, the reason for this is because MIC is a 
highly disordered protein. And what I mean by that is if you look at this image here, um, the blue sort of spiral is the same um, part of the, the protein that I've shown here. It's the portion that binds to the DNA. But if you look at the remainder of the protein shown here in orange and yellow, it's sort of this like mess of, it's like a big mess. It's very highly disordered. It doesn't have a firm structure. Um, it is extremely yeah. dynamic and moves around. Um, and because of this flexibility, we, we have not been able to fully see, know what it looks like. We don't know the structure of it. So we don't know how to, um, what parts of it we can, we can target or, or design drugs to, to inhibit it. Um, on another note, um, another reason why MYC is considered undruggable is because it is um, involved in a lot of normal physiological processes for normal like body functions. And so if we target MYC, um, we, we could risk having a lot of different side effects um, that affect those normal functions. So how do we go about drugging the undruggable? So what we've done is we've looked at a database of compounds and done a virtual screen of about 6 million compounds. And out of the 6 million compounds, we've ident identified certain compounds that sort of work be better than others. And we've modified them and you know, tweaked them and come up with um, one main compound shown here at the top right, we call VPC7619. Um, that has sort of worked the best. And how this compound works, it is, is it, sort of binds to the location of the micmax complex that binds to the DNA. So if that pocket is um, bound, it will not bind to the DNA and um, will not be able to do what its normal function is. So here I've shown the image of that pocket. So once again, this blue spiral is the MYC protein. The red spiral is the MAX protein. And this sort of gray globular structure here is that location that binds to the DNA. And our drug is this is shown in green here. Um, and it sort of fits tightly into that space. And because it's, it's there, it sort of blocks this location from binding to the DNA. So he, this is just a representation of how it works. So normally we have that MIC-MAX compound or complex that um, binds to the DNA and turns on these genes that allow for um, prost neuroendocrine prostate cancer development and progression. However, when we treat the cells with, with the, our drug, it will prevent that binding and those genes don't get turned on and ideally stop the growth of these cancer cells. So we've tested this compound. Um, in uh, some neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells. So let me explain this graph real quick. So we start off with 100% um, of the cells. And if you treat it with our drug and the drug works to kill the cells, um, you see less growth and the line sort of going downwards, which is what we do see here with these neuroendocrine prostate cancer cells. On the right here, what we wanted to do was to, to see whether our drug truly does affect the MYC protein. So we've taken these um, these cells, which actually do not have the MYC protein in it. And if it doesn't have MYC in it, it, sh it shouldn't be affected by a drug, which is what we do see. So we start off with 100% of the cells, and as we add the drug, um, they do not start dying, implying that our drug does um, target the, the MYC protein. Um, so this is just one of many experiments we will do to test our drug. Um, so we will test it in these sort of growth experiments to see that they stop the growth. We will look at how um, our drug affects MYC activity um, and its function. We will then look at whether our drug will bind directly to that site that binds the DNA on our complex. Um, and then after that, see that the drug does actually prevent the binding of MYC and MAX to the DNA. And finally, after all of that, we want to see if we can sort of solve the structure of the protein complex, so MYC and MAX together, with the drug um, in its in where we, we designed it to fit into to see that it does bind to its correct location. So I just want to thank my supervisors, Dr. Anada Lalas and Dr. Artem Cherkasov, as well as my collaborators and lab members. And lastly, a big thank you to PCFBC for funding this research. Thank you, and I will take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Um, do we have any questions from the audience?
I hope that wasn't too hard to understand. <laughs> hey, Jane. Well, I it was really good. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about NMIC and how it might be involved in even other types of cancers that are related to neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Um, so one, I've, I didn't mention this, the one good thing about NMIC is, so there are actually multiple MIC proteins in this MIC family. There's NMIC, CMIC, and LMIC. Um, CMIC is, is actually the, um, the MIC that is more, more widely expressed in, in normal functions. And what's good about NMIC is that it's, it's only expressed during development um, of, of different tissue types, but in the adult body, it's, it's only expressed in the brain and not much anywhere else. So to target NMIC would be more ideal than targeting the other, other mix as it will, it'll just go to where NMIC is expressed, which is usually in the cancers in adult tissues. So we see NMIC ex, um, that's being expressed in not just neuroendocrine prostate cancer, but also neuroblastoma, um, medulloblastoma, which are brain cancers, we see it in um, um, some childhood cancers, I think. Uh, yeah, other, other types of cancers that, that will, be, will also benefit from an NMIC inhibitor. Awesome. Um, there's a question here. Um, do you happen to know if external beam radiation affects these genes? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that. That's okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and then the other question was, um, are you collaborating with other Canadian centers? Um, mainly within uh, UBC. So uh, Dolly Nat Dr. Natalie Stradnatka is at UBC. She is a world-renowned crystallographer. Um, so we work with her to, to look at the structure of these proteins. And we also collaborate with SFU. Um, Dr. Robert Young is at SFU. So mainly within BC, but um, definitely in the future uh, within Canada as well. Um, what does Dr. Robert Young's lab do? Um, we mainly work with them, not part of this particular project, but they also um, help with the drug development process as well. Cool. Um, any other questions for the from the audience before we turn it over to our next presenter? Um, oh, we've got a question. How prevalent is NMIC in the body, I guess? No, turn it around. How prevalent is, is NEPC? Uh, NEPC is, it makes up less than 1% of prostate cancers. Um, so it's not super prevalent, but it, it is um, very aggressive and um, it's, it's not, not good. Fair enough. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, let's turn it over here. Okay. Um, and if anybody has any questions for Jane that they think of, you know, while watching the other presentations, there will be an opportunity to ask later. So our next presenter is Dr. Felipe Elti, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Urologic Sciences at UBC and is supervised by Dr. Michael Cox. Dr. Elti was also trained as a dentist in Chile at, and after seven years of clinical practice, moved to Canada to pursue his doctoral studies. Um, as a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Elti's research focuses on prostate cancer metastasis. Today, he will be speaking on his research, Effects of Prostate Cancer Metastasis in Vertebrae. All right. Hey. Thank you. Am I on stage now? Can you see everything? Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, well, thank you. And our project is called Effect of Prostate Cancer in Metastasis in Vertebrae. And as it was said in the, in the announcement, I'm from Chile, uh, if you want to know who this guy is. And of course, from Chile, you know, all Canadians love penguins, Patagonia, and the desert. And, but I live a little bit, a bit south although close to all of those places. But my work was in dentistry. I basically was focused on solving 
the most frequent dental problems in a, basically in population in risk, poor, poor population, as you can see here me, working in a camp in low, in low income setting, trying to teach my students. And I become some kind of expert. I, get, I gain a lot of expertise in analyzing mineralized tissue as bone or teeth or enamel, which are highly mineral tissues and their disease and alterations in order to prevent this pathology. So when I came to Canada to study materials engineering department and start working in the Canadian, Pro in the Vancouver Prostate Center, I realized that there's 90% of advanced prostate cancer metastasized to bone. And when I check out the literature, there's no much out there. Two or three papers with a proper analysis of the bone of prostate cancer, as we will analyze in other fields of a study of minerals uh, research. Uh, this bone metastasis produce severe pain or the most painful uh, effects of prostate cancer and produce weakness and bone fracture. And some of those fractures, if they're especially the ones in the spine, produce a spinal cord compression as the one we have here from our, one of our patients. Spinal cord, the fracture of the vertebrae here generates a spinal cord compression here. And this patient was immobilized from T, I think that was T6 and down, basically from the thorax and down. Um, so I decided to study this. And also there is another issue here. Most of these lesions are osteoblastic, which means they generate more bone, different from other countries that restore bone or destroy the bone. The prostate cancer is defined as a, as a tumor that generates more bone. So then there is a big question there. If lesions are osteoblastic or generates more bone, how is possible that they are associated to fracture or fragility? So I, I decided to study this project with uh, cadaveric samples from the University of Washington. We collect also surgical samples and we decide to analyze them in a three-dimensional way with a, with a high resolution micro CT scanner and analyze them as it would be done in a materials engineering department where I did my PhD. And, and combine this with the cellular and molecular analysis of these samples. The most important part, of course, is the team. So I, we recruit, a, we collect or recruit, gather a really strong team with Dr. Con Morrissey, who's the University of Washington, Rafael Chares Morina, our spine surgeon, that give us a call every time she has a patient and we can access those samples. Dr. Ritzi Wang here, that was my PhD supervisor from the Department of Materials Engineering. And he provides the tools to analyze at the molecular and atomic level these samples. And Dr. Michael Cox, that I think everybody knows in this in here, he uh, is highly involved in the molecular analysis and the biological analysis of these samples. Preliminary results, we received these samples that Dr. Morris has sent from the University of Washington from the autopsy program. And these are cadaver examples. Cadaver examples, we cannot use them to analyze biological conditions because it's really not the, the focus and the, preser the, the preservation is not that good, but we can analyze the minerals here. And that's what we have here in a 10 micron, really fine resolution scanner. We, can, we could scan these two samples and we can see that the structure here is totally abnormal, does not correspond to normal bone. It has more bone though. It's much more bone density, especially here. It's way less spaces, but if you see, with further detail, the, the structure here looks like foamy. It's like a foam. We call them in the group marshmallow. Basically, it's generating more bone, but without the structure that will allow it to resist compression, which is the main objective of bone in every, everywhere it is in the body. When we went to analyze them with SEM, with high resolution SEM, and here I took a sample that have a piece of normal bone, which is here, the one, the brightest or with the asterisk in the top in the B panel. And that's more or less how normal bone looks like. And what's around it and the bottom one are the analysis of pathologic bone by cancer affected bone. And we can see the structure is totally different with less fibers, less structure, 
not really directional, not really a clear direction on the fibrils of collagen here, or the fibrils or the trabeculi. And also way more, much more porous. And pores makes materials brittle. That's a materials analysis comment. And when we analyze the cell composition of this, in histological analysis of these two patients that we have here that suffer a fracture that you can see affect their spinal cord, as you can see in this tag here. Um, we have basically two patterns of organization of the cancer cells that migrate to bone and form this uh, metastasis. One is the one we see in the upper panel where the cells cluster and gather trying to make a new prostate there. Basically, they're making new acinis, new secretory units, quite similar to how a prostate look like with this cells clustering in a group. Actually, with the staining of the, the, the PSMA, this molecule actually in the inside part, like here, like, and basically resembling a new prostate in the bone. But there is another group of cells that spread along and get close to the actual bone tissue. This is a bone tissue here with the asterisk. And the brown cells are prostate cancer cells. And they really attach to the bone and start talking or doing something to the bone cells that are here. This, this is a bone cell, another bone cell. And the prostate cancer cell basically gather around them and start probably for some mechanisms that we don't know affecting this bone growth and bone generation. So in general, until now, we have that the structural alterations in collagen and mineral composition of the bone are present in the prostate cancer metastasis. We need to increase our numbers, but we know that there is a clear alteration in the morphology of the bone. So despite, although there is more bone, it's abnormal. It's totally non-properly organized and the mineral and the collagen matrix are not in the right position or direction. We will do mechanical testing of the samples. And importantly, we, will, we need to analyze nerves to evaluate pain, basically see how the nerves are affected by these cells and how that's what we will aim to do during the next year. And importantly is to determine cell and molecular analysis to determine risk factor and prevention, since this is one of the main complications of prostate cancer. The idea will be to determine what type of prostate cancer, what type of cells are more keen to, to do this abnormal lesions and pathologic fractures, so we can identify those patients and prevent them. That's the idea and our acknowledgement, of course, the first one to our patients, our their family, everybody consent for this, and our collaborations and the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And I hope to talk to you about this in a few more years to give you the final results of this research. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. LT? Does he know of any other organization that's doing this kind of research? Well, this kind of research is, I that's, that's why I started because I couldn't believe that nobody was studying the bone as the main matter. Probably, there are a few issues and I can name you a few. Bone, when the, when the patient have these fractures or this bone metastasis, they usually don't get surgery. And in case they get surgery, they're not biopsy. So when I went to a UBC hospital to ask for biopsies of these samples, they don't have any. Because the patient is known to have prostate cancer. So there's no need to do a biopsy to do, yeah, there's no need to, to do diagnosis. It's known that it's a prostate cancer, it's metastasis of prostate cancer, so everything goes to garbage. So what I've done in the, in the last year is whenever I receive a call, I just go and tell the surgeon, please, everything you're throwing away, put it here. And I'll work with it. So basically there's not. And the only place they have samples is this rapid autopsy program, which is in the Fred Hutchinson Center in the University of Washington. But they analyze the cellular biology of the metastasis. They don't have the the capability or the knowledge to analyze in a materials perspective, crystal atoms and the more materials engineering. So that's why when we contact Dr. Morrissey, he 
kindly provide us the samples. We show him the results and now he's sending more samples from those patients. But that's an autopsy program. It's the only people that collect bone is from autopsies. That's there, there, are, there are other programs that are interested in the immune environment of these bone True. specimens, right? So out of Boston and the surrounding MIT groups, they've been very interested in the immunotherapy from this perspective. But again, there's no one else in the world that's really looking at this level of resolution, level of detail at how the cancer actually affects the bone architecture itself. And actually in Colorado, Colorado, there's the other group that also work with this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that you're right. That, that's the thing. We've got um, two questions in the chat here. Uh, once the prostate cancer has moved to the bones, is it terminal? Sorry? Um, once the prostate cancer has moved to the bones, is it terminal? Well, it's an advanced prostate cancer. Yeah, that is the final stage. It, 90% of advanced prostate cancer have a bone metastasis. The studies are done in autopsies of patients who die from prostate cancer, said almost 100% of the patients get it. Then it's harder to treat. Yeah, that's is the, is the worst part. And the, the most painful because well, in every patient of cancer, you know that the, the, the bone is the most painful part of the, of the process. So, yeah. um, can you take live samples from a patient prior to radiation? Oof. No, that's, that's an ethical problem. Uh, we, our, our patients, the only way we can get samples is patients that already have a fracture that have surgical indication. It's not possible to get. And the other people works with bone, work with mouse model, but bone, mouse bone is not even similar to humans at all. So it's not, it's not a parallel. The way of standing, standing, the sample optation is the key. And that's why we're in a year, we have obtained three already. So I aim to get to five or six and have a decent project with that number. Thank you. Um, I'll do one more question, if that's okay. Okay. Um, could the bone generated possibly rupture the nerves? Yep, that's part of what I want to analyze. See how the bones, usually they say in other type of cancers, because of the pH, when you're generating something, but it's not, nothing is really clear. It's, there's no real studies on how the nerves distribute there. As I told you, there, there are no samples. Nobody has a really good collection of samples to do imaging, a few cadaveric sample centers. And it's, it's, it's not much out there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay, um, our next presenter is um, Karen Kana, PhD candidate. Um, where are you? There you are, spotlight you. <laughs> um, PhD candidate in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC working with Dr. Carla Williams. Karen is also a registered pharmacist with a keen interest in personalized medicine. Today, he will be speaking on his award-winning research, biomarker analysis of extracellular vesicles to improve prostate cancer detection. Perfect. Uh, can anyone, everyone see my screen? Yep, okay, perfect. Um, so my name is uh, Karen Panna. Um, and uh, like uh, she mentioned, I am uh, a PhD candidate studying under uh, Dr. Carla Williams uh, in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences um, at UBC. And uh, we're uh, focusing on analyzing biomarkers uh, expressed in extracellular vesicles to help improve the uh, diagno a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Um, so current methods to help screen for prostate cancer are still limited uh, to the PSA blood test and uh, digital rectal examinations. However, uh, both of these tests are not perfect. Um, cases of prostate cancer can either be missed or falsely diagnosed uh, due to the inaccuracies of these tests. Uh, for example, uh, for every 10 people that are screened with a PSA blood test, uh, about 25% of these people will have uh, an elevated PSA and not have prostate cancer. Uh, between uh, around 30% of these cases will have an elevated uh, PSA, but they might not even be treated uh, since the uh, prostate cancer is a very slow growing disease. Um, and 15% of these cases might even be missed. For this reason, um, uh, we're focusing on identifying alternative, non invasive, and rapid diagnostic markers. And one of these areas 
uh, where we can look at is uh, to help create rapid diagnostic markers uh, that can be implemented into practice quickly is through the analysis of blood. Um, so inside the blood, we can have circulating tumor cells, we can have uh, proteins that are being excreted, um, and a lots of DNA, RNA. Um, and what Dr. Carla Williams lab focuses on studying is these very small nanoparticles um, called extracellular vesicles uh, as a novel method to help diagnose prostate cancers. So uh, in a single milliliter of blood plasma, there's ne nearly 10 billion extracellular, extracellular vesicles present. Uh, these uh, can range anywhere from 40 to 1,000 nanometers, and they carry very important information uh, regarding the cells uh, they're being released from. Uh, most importantly, uh, nearly all cells in our body uh, release these EDs, uh, including the cancerous cells. Um, and our focus is on identifying uh, EVs released by cancerous cells of the prostate uh, and comparing this to the EVs released by healthy cells of the prostate uh, with the goal of uh, helping uh, to improve the treatment of prostate cancer uh, by identifying these differences. Um, so. Uh, in order to identify prostate-derived EVs, uh, we focused on characterizing biomarkers that are commonly overexpressed in prostate cancer cells, uh, similar to like uh, STEEP1 or PSMA. So in our case, we focused on STEEP1, uh, which is known as the sixth transmembrane epithelial antigen of the prostate. STEEP1 has recently been shown to be an emerging target for uh, various clinical applications, uh, including uh, immunotherapy, uh, and clinical imaging. Um, in healthy adults, the expression of STEEP1 is fairly low, um, but this becomes elevated in prostate cancer. Um, so we thought since EVs will be released from prostate cancer cells, they may also have more STEEP1 expression as well. Um, however, uh, STEEP1 has not been studied as a diagnostic tool or been investigated uh, to help identify someone that would have a more aggressive prostate cancer, for example. Um, for that reason, we focused on characterizing the expression of STEEP1 on uh, EVs. Um, one method that our lab has optimized to help uh, accomplish this uh, is something called uh, nanoscale flow cytometry. This technology helps us uh, I, uh, detect small particles uh, in a sample, whether it be urine or blood plasma, uh, in a very rapid manner. And we can probe for um, markers of our choice or biomarkers of our choice uh, using fluorescent markers. Um, and uh, in order to validate that our uh, flow cytometer was capable of detecting these uh, nanoparticles, um, uh, Dr. Nikki Selman from our lab um, used uh, various ranges of silica beads and a a biological particle, uh, just a virus that was about 122 nanometers. Um, and we tried to resolve these on our uh, flow cytometry. Um, and you can see through these big peaks um, that appear um, that they're, uh, we're, we're able to resolve anywhere from 100 nanometers all the way up to 1300 nanometers. Um, and this kind of provides the evidence that uh, we would be able to see something like this through uh, blood plasma. Um, next, uh, using an isolation method, uh, we separated extracellular vesicles from plasma uh, to help remove all of the other stuff that can be present, like proteins, um, DNA, um, and stuff. Um, and we helped visualize them using a scanning electron microscopy. Um, and you can uh, see where these arrows point, uh, these small concave-shaped uh, vesicles, um, and which were predominantly uh, present in fraction one and two. Uh, and then once we isolated these, we then ran them on that flow cytometry, cytometer to see if we could even detect them. Um, so this is like a typical plot here that represents um, uh, what we would see when we run a sample on, on the flow cytometry. Um, and here we probed for steep one expression. Um, so I've drawn these red boxes uh, where um, uh, there is fluorescence present. 
And each single one of these blue dots in that red zone uh, represents an EV positive for steep one. And just like the previous image, we can see uh, most of these events fall within fraction one and fraction two, um, uh, where we thought the EVs would be. Um, and then to ensure these are indeed EVs, uh, we then added a detergent to the sample uh, to help break these EVs apart. Uh, so this is somewhat similar to how we uh, use soap to help break down fats. Um, you can see that positive population uh, just disappear. Um, and this kind of strengthens the evidence that these are actually EVs that we uh, can see and detect using this platform. Um, and then to make this uh, even, even faster method, uh, we probe for it just from whole plasma. Um, so this is a uh, this is what the plots would look like when we probe for steep one in whole plasma. Um, and these are just representative images uh, between healthy plasma and uh, prostate cancer uh, prostate cancer patients plasma. Um, and then we quantified um, the amount of uh, positive events uh, between uh, 121 prostate cancer patients and 50 uh, healthy age match uh, controls. Um, and uh, from this, we noticed that uh, patients with prostate cancer um, had a significantly elevated amount of C1 EVs uh, compared to healthy males. Um, but this doesn't truly provide the most valuable information uh, because many people, uh, patients with low risk disease, still have very good outcomes and can likely avoid treatment. So we uh, try to analyze them uh, based off of their Gleason scores um, to help analyze any differences that might be present um, and whether this could help risk stratify our patients and identify those that actually truly need to be treated. However, uh, if once we risk uh, uh, sorry, once we separate them based off their Gleason score, we can't really see a difference based off of the steep one levels. It, they're all just elevated uh, compared to a healthy uh, plasma. Um, and nor did this correlate with any disease recurrence. Um, so this is where, um, where we're gonna be focusing on uh, with our current project, uh, which uh, is gonna look at identifying additional biomarkers uh, that might be ex expressed alongside steep one, because we, believe that these additional biomarkers are present and they, they will help us distinguish between low risk and high risk disease. Um, so uh, in order to do this, uh, we're gonna be identifying proteins that might be expressed aside, alongside C1 uh, in high risk prostate cancer patients by specifically taking out these uh, steep one expressing EVs and sequencing them for the, for the proteins that are expressed alongside them. Uh, since some of these uh, biomarkers of EVs may not be ex may be expressed at very very low levels. Uh, part of our project will also be focused on focusing on developing technologies uh, to help detect these biomarkers using even brighter probes, uh, which might help um, uh, detect these even better. Um, and then what we hope that this will lead to is a prostate cancer test that might look something like this. Um, where someone can rapidly be screened with high certainty uh, to determine whether they're healthy, uh, whether they need, they need to be monitored uh, for the expression of these additional biomarkers or be treated immediately and have very good outcomes once they are treated. Um, overall, um, our project really demonstrates that these steep one EVs provide important diagnostic information but we still do require these additional markers to help improve the detection of high-risk prostate cancer. And hopefully through earlier uh, detection and improved uh, prediction of outcomes, um, this study may help improve the quality of life uh, of those affected by prostate cancer. Um, and then with that, I would just like to uh, acknowledge the support uh, from my supervisor, Dr. Carla Williams, um, uh, our, my postdoc, or our postdoc in the lab, Dr. Nikki Salman, which, uh, who really helped me with uh, most of that project, um, and our collaborators and the rest of my lab members, and uh, to the foundation as well for uh, really uh, supporting this project. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thanks, Karen. 
Um, got a question here in the chat. If this research was successful, how many hospitals or labs would have the equipment to identify EVs at this level of magnification? Um, so this is relatively new technology, um, but I, I think it'd be, it could quite easily be implemented. Um, uh, typical hospitals have a flow cytometer um, and this is just like a small addition to that um, that would quickly be able to implement something like this. Great. Um, we've got a question from Dr. Cox. Yeah. Hey, Karan. Um, hey. So back to Bob's initial question, talk about your collaborators like Han and the other guys and, and where they are in the world. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Dr. Han Leung from the University of Toronto. Um, uh, and uh, he, he was previously at the Mayo Clinic down in the States as well. Uh, Dr. Russ Alger is from uh, UBC Chemistry Department, and uh, he's a leading expert on developing uh, these probes, for, uh, brighter fluorescent probes. Um, Dr. Uh, sorry, Callan Lin is uh, from the London Biobank, uh, where we collect these um, uh, prostate cancer patient uh, plasma samples. And uh, Andrew Johnson is at um, the UBC Flow Cytometry Court, uh, where we've helped uh, uh, isolate these steep one EVs using uh, uh, adapted techno uh, uh, new technology. Awesome. I have a question just about the um, about the steep one. Was there any correlation with the steep one in the PSA level? Uh, there was not. You, you, you haven't looked, did you, that was looked at or not looked at? We did look at it and there was no correlation between the two. Okay. Thanks, Mario. Um, anyone else? Oh, here we go. Uh, are you hopeful that this approach could eventually differentiate between aggressive and non-aggressive cancer and why? I, I'm quite hopeful because it, it's an avenue that hasn't really been looked at, right? So. Uh, until we look there, we're, we're never going to know. And um, I, I really think this is going to be a method to um, uh, help differentiate between low and high grade disease and quickly implement something like this into practice. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, no worries. Um, all righty. So our next presenter is Poor Merrick Dick. Or, Ur Marich Dikbas, PhD candidate, completing his research at the LAC Laboratory at the Vancouver Prostate Center. Just gonna spotlight him here. I can find you. There you are. Oh, and then you disappeared. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay, um, originally from Turkey, Ur's master's research focused on the repair of UV-induced DNA damages and their repair. He'll be speaking on his research entitled Structural Characterization of Hawks B13 as a novel pharmacological target to treat castration-resistant prostate cancer. Over to you. Just a second, please. Yeah, no problem. Okay, can you see my uh, slides? Yep, looks great. Perfect. Um, I am Ur Mirstikbash. I am from Turkey. Uh, I did my master's in UV-induced DNA damages and how they are repaired in uh, bacterial cells. And now I am a PhD student at Lack Lab, Vancouver Prostate Center, and I am working on structural characterization of FOXP13 as a novel pharmacological target to treat castration-resistant prostate cancer. In a simpler words, I'm trying to find a better drug target to cure late stages of prostate cancer. So as we all know, uh, prostate cancer is the most uh, frequently diagnosed type of cancer among Canadian men. It affects one out of seven men in their lifetime and and androgen deprivation therapy is the standard of care to treat local advanced recurrent or metastatic forms of uh, prostate cancer. While this treatment is initially affected, uh, effective, the disease almost always develops resistance and recurs as castration-resistant prostate cancer. 
And uh, as scientists, we have been focusing on androgen receptor for um, last tens of years. Uh, and we currently urgently need a new therapeutic target to better treat advanced prostate cancer. For that reason, I want to introduce you Hox genes. So uh, Hox genes are a family of genes. They function in embryonic development. They basically specify the body plan of an embryo. I mean, you can think these uh, gene family as architects of the body and tell which part of the body will be tail and which part will be the head. They will organize the position of organs and uh, development. And you may guess that any disruption to this family may cause serious developmental defects. For example, in here, if you switch to Hox protein that is responsible for antenna formation in fruit flights, uh, with another Hox protein that is responsible for leg formation, you will observe legs in the uh, place of antenna on top of uh, fruit flies head. And Hox genes function in a similar way in humans as well. As well. There are 39 different Hox genes uh, that are functioning in embryonic development. But I want to focus on one of these Hox genes. It is called Hox P13. Hox P13 is involved in the development of the prostate. It works as a team with other proteins to form a healthy prostate tissue during embryonic development. And you may guess any disruption to HOXP13 expression causes defects in prostate uh, development. But HOXP13 is unique in prostate biology. Its expression maintained in adults. What does that mean? So even though this, important, this gene is important in the uh, embryonic development stages, its expression is maintained in adults. That means that this protein is doing something in the maintenance of the healthy prostate tissue. And the second point is, this protein is highly specific to prostate. As shown in the graph, it is really specific to prostate. And that means that if we are able to target this protein, it's gonna have minimum side effects on other tissues. And this protein has been linked to prostate cancer in several studies. For example, it's abnormal expression has been linked to prostate cancer. It has been observed in a uh, prostate cancer patients. And there are several mutations on this gene that will increase the risk of getting prostate. For example, there's one gene, one single amino acid change in the whole protein causes an 10 times more risk of getting prostate cancer. And as I mentioned before, this protein works as a team uh, to keep the prostate tissue healthy or develop a uh, healthy prostate tissue. And any disruption in this teamwork will cause prostate cancer as well. So as a fact, we know that HOXP13 is highly expressed in prostate cancer patients. And the question comes, what happens if we deplete HOXP13 in these cancer cells? And we have others tried to show that. So we basically took uh, multiple prostate cancer uh, cells and depleted HOXP13 in them. And then we check the effect of HOXP13 depletion to prostate cancer cell growth. As you can see, highlighted in red here, when you deplete HOXP13, percent growth that goes really low. And as shown in the field, while cancer uh, cell growth uh, significantly decreases, non-prostatic cells are not affected with this HOXP13 depletion. That also supports the idea of getting minimum side effects on other tissues. And we wanted to went ahead and try it on mice experiments as well. What we did here, we basically uh, injected prostate cancer cells to the left side of the animal, while we're uh, injecting the same prostate cancer cells, but without HOXP13 to the right side of the animal. Then we wanted to uh, monitor the tumor size. And these are the results. We can see, like if you look at the left side, prostate cancer injected side, you can see a gradual increase of the tumor size. But if you look at the right side, these are the same prostate cancer cells without HOXP13. And you can see there's almost no growth of the tumor. And if you compare the top panel with the bottom level, we can, as a fact, tell that HOXP13 loss significantly decreases tumor growth. But the question comes, how can we target HOXP13 in uh, cancer patients then. So it's not, uh, for that reason, we are looking for a drug that will go to our protein, HOXP13, it will bind to it and it destroys it. This is what we want, right? But for that, we need to first understand the structure of the protein. Every protein has a unique shape, unique structure, unique um, surface characteristics. And this actually determines the job of the protein in the cell. And you can think them as a puzzle pieces. If they are binding to each other, let's uh, take DNA and uh, let's say protein-protein interaction. If two proteins are interacting to each other, 
They should fit like two puzzle pieces. And if we can understand this puzzle piece, this protein, we can actually find the pockets on this puzzle piece and design drugs that will fit those pockets. And if we um, uh, attach a protein killer, killer uh, to that drug, they basically our drug will go to our Hoxb thirteen target and it's gonna destroy it. And hopefully it's gonna destroy the tumor cells as well. But the problem is Hoxb thirteen's structure is currently unknown. So we cannot design drugs uh, right now. First, we need to uh, find the structure of our protein of interest. And this is the first aim of my project. Um, and this is not a trivial job. First, you need to provide a Hox, the protein of interest you are trying to structure. And sometimes proteins are really, really hard to purify. Some, uh, while some proteins are easy to purify, especially Hox B13 is really hard to purify. And after you get the pure, uh, more than 95% pure protein, yeah, we screen thousands of thousands of random conditions to find a condition in which your uh, our protein is stable and forms a ordered uh, solid structure. And this step is also really hard because you are screening thousands of like random conditions and you are looking for one condition only. And it can sometimes take, uh, if you are lucky, it can take three or four months. But if you are not lucky, you can get five years, 10 years working on it, and you will still uh, get no crystals. Sometimes these protein crystals are even more expensive than diamond samples. After getting the protein crystals, if we are lucky, uh, you can shoot these crystals with X-ray beams. From that X-ray experiments, you will solve a structure of the protein, structure of your protein. It's going to look like uh, this, this blue. Uh, thing here. And after searching the pockets on the surface of this protein, we can combine computer science and chemistry to design small molecules that will fit into those pockets. And uh, this is the main aim of our uh, uh, first project. And currently, we are at this step. We were able to purify this really hard to purify protein. And as I as our knowledge, this is the first time a, a lab is able to purify Hoxb13 in full length and native condition. And we went ahead and screened thousands of crystal conditions and we were able to get initial hits from that. So we are at a step of optimizing those crystal conditions. So we wanna make them better. Let me put it that way, a more diffractive way. And after that, we will shoot it and hopefully solve the structure of it for drug development studies. And as a second part of my project, uh, as I mentioned before, it's like biochemical characterization of Hoxb13 core regulator interaction interface. In a simpler word, how it works as a team. As I mentioned, Hoxb13 functions with all the other proteins to keep prostate cells uh, healthy, right? And any disruption to this teamwork will cause cancers, prostate cancer. If you remember the mutation that I mentioned, it happens here uh, in between the protein protein inter interaction interface. So any disruption to this interaction can cause higher risk of prostate cancer. So for that reason, we will basically chop up our protein and other team workers, and we will try to map the exact interaction site. After finding the exact interaction site, we will try to understand how they are interacting, how they are dysregulated in prostate cancer, and we will be one step closer to understanding prostate cancer. So everything is under progress right now, but we have really promising, promising uh, results in our hand. Hopefully, uh, I think it's very excited. Uh, I, am, I need to repeat this again. We are the first lab to have the full length protein in our hands, and we are really excited to work with it. So that brings to me to the end of my uh, presentation. I wanna thank my PI, Dr. Uh, Nathan Lag. I want to thank every member of uh, LAC Lab in both VPC and Koch University. I want to thank uh, Petagym Lab, Lawless Lab. These are uh, great protein labs located in UBC and VPC, respectively. And of course, I want to thank uh, PCFBC for great, uh, this chance to speak here, uh, present my present uh, research here, and funding our uh, research. And Thank you all for the motivation and everything. It's great to be with you. So this keeps us pushing every uh, research. And if you have any questions, I am so happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions?
Can I stop sharing to see the questions? Sure, that'd be great. Anyone? I don't have a question, but I just want to say I, I love your enthusiasm. So far, everybody, that just makes us feel so much better about raising money and, and putting it into research when we know you guys are really doing everything you can to make it happen. So on behalf of everybody, thank you so much. Yeah, I also want to thank you all because, you know, when we are re doing research, we focus on so small things. We sometimes forget uh, the big picture and being with you and like uh, participating in those events like motivate us. That shows us like we are serving a great cause. So a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Warren. Um, <clears throat> some time ago, before the pandemic, I attended a very informative presentation from a uh, very very smart immunotherapy doctor. And uh, his explanation was that uh, the DNA in your body and every one of your cells talks to each other via a code that's similar to uh, a barcode on items that you purchase at the store. And for some reason, the switches work in an on-off function and something causes these biological switches to turn on when they should be turned off or turned off when they should be turned on. And in his books, that is the secret to curing all cancers because if he found the drug that could turn on specific gene switches, uh, he could basically reverse uh, any cancer at any stage. And uh, he's been very successful at doing that with blood cancers such as lymphoma or uh, uh, anything that's circulating through your blood. And I do believe he's had marginal success with uh, pancreatic cancer as well. So anyway, I just wanted to share that information with you. Uh, our lab is also uh, very interested in uh, those switches within the genome. Uh, but yeah, uh, the main challenge about these approaches are, you know, um, specifically targeting those cancers. And these are all uh, very uh, good approaches. Hopefully we will get something. Okay, so thanks again, Ur. Um, last but not least, we have Dr. Stephen Choi, postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Dr. Wang, a leading expert in the field of prostate cancer modeling. Dr. Choi's doctoral dissertation focused on the critical role of MCT4 in suppressing the anti-cancer immune response. And he's here speaking about his latest research on developing MCT4 targeting drugs for treating advanced prostate cancers. All right, so hopefully everything works out here. <laughs> all right, just to make sure you guys can all see the slides all right. Yes. Okay, so thank you everybody for this opportunity for me to present um, my research. And of course, thank you PCFPC for being so generous as to be funding this project uh, for this year. And so of course, I'm excited about the work that is happening and I'm excited to be telling you about it as well. And so um, just to begin with, um, as the introduction said, this is actually something that I've been working with for quite a while now. Back in 2012, I first joined uh, Dr. Wang's lab as a graduate student. And so at that point in time, um, because I was a fresh student, he was like, well, why don't you try something different? And why don't you try to see if there's a different approach to treating cancer? And so a lot of current research, um, just as an analogy that we came up with, it's kind of like skipping off branches on a tree. Like it works very well. I mean, you cut off a branch, it's, it's cut off, right? So if you're able to find something specific about a specific kind of cancer and that you can find a drug for it, well, that's going to be a very effective strategy. But unfortunately, that's going to be only effective for a certain subset of cancer for very specific subtypes. And so at that point in time, it's like, yes, that approach works. But we were wondering, well, is there something that can be maybe more broadly applicable? So of course, to prostate cancer and the different kinds of prostate cancer, but also um, to many different types of cancer as well. And so at that point in time, we're thinking, okay, if we're using branches as an analogy, can we go down this tree, maybe find something that's closer to the stump that we can target? And hopefully by doing so, we would find a therapeutic strategy that is effective across many different kinds of advanced cancer. And so as I was doing that research at that point in time, I was looking at some of these different options. 
And so we were able to find possibly, um, at that point was a hypothesis. And of course, since then we've done some experiments and some research and have validated that hypothesis, but that there was a way that we can target one aspect of cancer cells that leads on to a lot of downstream effects as well. And so from targeting MCT4, there's a couple of things that we think we're able to do. So first of all, we're, we think we're able to, of course, block cancer metabolism. We're hoping that it can stop cancer spread. We are hoping that it can maybe reduce resistance to treatment, to suppress the growth of blood vessels, and ultimately to also help um, the immune system attack cancer cells. And so the question is, well, how does this work? How are we able to accomplish all of this? And so it begins with the fact that cancer cells have a different metabolism than normal cells. So normally, if a cell is supposed to grow, is supposed to work properly, they would take glucose, break it down, and break it down ultimately to carbon dioxide. And that is what we call normal metabolism. That's something that your typical normal cells would do. But it has been known for almost 100 years now that cancer cells have this weird and different way of using energy. And so instead of taking glucose and making a lot of carbon dioxide, cancer cells take glucose, go halfway, and then makes a lot of lactic acid instead. And so for the longest time, people have, and scientists especially have thought that, well, this lactic acid was just a waste product. And then this lactic acid gets taken out of the cell, makes the tumor very acidic, and they think that, well, it doesn't help cancers grow that much. But unfortunately, this is what cancer cells have to deal with. But as we've done more and more research on this, and as different people have done more research on this, we've come to notice that actually lactic acid and an acidic tumor microenvironment um, is more advantageous for cancers than we first thought. And so I've already touched on a number of those things before. Maybe it's growing blood vessels, maybe it's helping them spread. But one of the very important aspects of lactic acid is that it can suppress the anti-cancer immunity. And so one way of thinking about our immune system is that it kind of works like a seesaw. There's going to be the activated portion of it, the ones that kill viruses and bacteria and, and cancer cells. So you normally think that, okay, if you catch a cold or if you get a flu, that is the part of the immune system you want to work to be able to clear um, your pathogens and your viruses and of course cancer cells as well. But there's a second half to this, which is the suppression side of it, is that you don't want your immune system to continuously be activated. Then you're like, if once the infection is cleared, you want your immune system to be able to stop. And so that is where the suppression side comes in to, to stop the immune system from overworking. And so when it comes to the cancer situation, what we find is that in an acidic environment with lactic acid, it suppresses the active part of it, such that the thing, such that the killing functions no longer work, but the suppressing functions continue to work. And so overall, as a seesaw, then you tip the balance towards suppressing the immune system. And so the cancer is allowed to grow. And so with all of this information, we then synthesized it into a hypothesis, which we call the lactic acid suppression theory, where under normal, under in, in cancer situations, it makes a lot of lactic acid. And so if we're able to block a lactic acid transporter that is in the cancer cells, we would hope to have a lot of different downstream effects. And so of all these different ones, the primary ones that we're focusing on is the ability to block cancer metabolism and the ability to restore anti-cancer immunity. And so blocking metabolism is what we consider a direct effect on cancer cells and restoring anti-cancer immunity is what we consider an indirect from the, from the tumor microenvironment. And so together, all of these things then funnel hopefully into causing increased cancer cell death. So one of the primary proteins that is involved in doing this is the MCT4 transporter. And so it is, um, many people looking at many different cancers have seen that MCT4 expression is increased um, as the cancer as it gets more and more aggressive. And, and so, uh, 
so yeah, a lot of different aggressive cancers have more MCT4 expression. And so we think if we're able to inhibit MCT4 function to find a drug for it, then we can have a good therapeutic, um, therapeutic option for, of course, advanced prostate cancers, but also many other cancer types as well. And so just to give you a general sense of the workflow that happens, um, you've already heard a little bit from Jane, especially that, uh, that there are, Dr. Cherkasov is one of our key collaborators on this project. And he has built an entire computer-based platform that is able to screen drugs quickly and to arrive at possible drugs that we can test in the lab. And so how it goes is that, as you've also heard from some of these other projects already, that we would first start with a computer model of what the MCT4 protein might look like. We would find a place that a drug can possibly bind to. And then in the computer, we would go through all these different tests to speed up the drug develop, development process. We would be able to screen billions, if millions, if not billions of compound and say, come up with 50 that we think would be the best. And so from there, we take it into the lab. And this is where a lot of my work comes in of screening these compounds, of finding out which ones work and which one doesn't. And then we can go through different rounds of optimization to hopefully come up with a good drug that inhibits MCT4 and is not very toxic. And so we've done a number of different rounds at this point. And just to give you a representation or a little bit of a flavor in terms of what these drugs are actually able to do, so here we have prostate cancer cells that are grown in a dish. And so what we are able to do is we're able to either just grow these cells or add immune cells to them. And then we can throw in our compound as well. And so what we're able to see is that the blue line here is just the prostate cancer cells. And so the blue line, they grow. And then of course, once they crowd out the dish then they stop growing and that's kind of the, the, the end of, of, of your tumor. And so when we add immune cells to it, and this is the black line, you see some delay of cancer cell growth. And so this is similar to what you would expect that there is some immune reaction against cancer cells, but not fully. And that is part of the challenge in the clinic is that the immune cells are suppressed and they don't kill your cancer cells. And so with our compounds alone, we're able to have half of an effect so this is the one side of our hypothesis where we're able to inhibit cancer cells directly by blocking their metabolism. But it is when we put our compound and immune cells together, then this is where we get a lot more cancer cell killing. And this is where we hope to see that the combined effects of both inhibiting cancer cells directly and reactivating the anti-cancer immunity. And so of course, there's a lot of work that goes on behind it. There's a lot of different experiments that we do, and we do have a great team um, that, that is working together to do all of these different uh, parts of the project. But just to give you a sense of some of the ongoing work that we have in mind. Um, so first of all, our current best compounds are able to show the characters, characteristics that we want. It can inhibit lactic acid discharge. It can inhibit cell proliferation. It can restore anti-cancer immunity. And then some preliminary testing that we've already done seems to suggest that these, these drugs are generally safe and not super toxic. And so of course, at this stage, we're hoping, and especially with the support of PCFBC, to be optimizing these compounds, either improving how effective they are, how specific they are, or whether they are tolerated um, inside the body. And so we would like to be able to optimize these compounds, confirm their safety, and then ultimately, um, as the project continues on down the road in the next three to five years or so, we would hopefully be able to have a good drug that we can then file an IND application and then enter clinical trials in prostate cancer patients. So um, as a brief summary then, lactic acid is actually able to promote a lot of different aspects of biology that's super important for cancer growth and survival. And so inhibiting MCT4 is one of these things that we're hoping to do to be able to stop cancer growth. And so using the computer technology that we have at the Prostate Center and in collaboration with Dr. Cherkasov, we're able to identify some novel compounds, some, some chemicals that can inhibit MCT4. And of course we are finding that these compounds are effective and we're working on optimizing these to eventually down the road um, begin clinical trials. And so of course, like I said, this is not just my own work, but a lot of different collaborators, a lot of different scientists, 
and a lot of different um, people in the lab who's helped me out. And so of course I would like to just take this time to thank them and also thank all the funding agencies throughout the years um, that have supported us. And at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, does anybody, oh, we've got a question here in the chat. Um, it's my understanding that intense exercise generates lactic acid in muscles, yet intense exercise has been shown to slow cancer progression. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so um, my best guess as to what's happening here is that it's happening at different places. So intense exercise that generates lactic acid, a lot of that happens in the muscle. And so then it goes into the blood and your liver is able to process a lot of that. And so in, in that sense, it might not necessarily directly um, affect your tumor. And so then the benefits of exercise then is able to sort of counteract uh, the cancer growth. And so this is slightly different than in the cancer, in the tumor specifically, where there's a lot of lactate that is generated, a lot, lot of lactate that is generated. Makes sense. Um, I have a follow up. Go ahead. So describe to us why this approach is good for targeting the cancer and will not interrupt the ability of the muscle cells, for example, to expel the lactate that they generate during their activity. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is something that we are trying to study. Like we do, we are aware that, okay, there's a possibility that our drug might inhibit um, muscle function, or at least maybe it will reduce the capacity of how much exercise you might be able to do, especially the intense kind of exercise. Um, so we don't have a very good answer. We haven't done enough experiments on that yet to be able to answer that question very well. Um, but um, it is something on that we're MCT1. aware of. So MCT1, um, MCT1 is actually in all of the tissues in the body. And so that's how we're trying to avoid that. Like if you're inhibiting MCT1, you might hit your lungs, you might have heart problems, it might target the brain, but MCT4 is the one that's more specific to muscles. And so I guess, at least in our minds, we're like, okay, if we're stopping muscle function, it's probably a better drug than if we're stopping heart function, for example. And so MCT4 is a little bit more specific to cancer in that way. 